Good morning. How are you? Okay, so how many of you were at my workshop earlier this morning? So you probably have an idea of what I'm about to do right now. I'm going to get you to move. I'm going to get you to get up in just a second when I say go, and I need you to find a stranger, and I need you to introduce yourself to them, and I need you to ask them or tell them one critical thing. What's been the most challenging part about being a disciple of Jesus Christ for you? You have two minutes to accomplish your mission. One person shares for a minute, then the next person shares for a minute. I'm really serious. You need to get out of your seats, and you need to go find someone you don't know right now. Go. Should be switching right about now. Should be switching. <clears throat> Thirty seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Ah! <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's not get too friendly. Remember, we are Catholic. Well. I hope you're at the right conference. This is uh, spiritual warfare in the trenches. When I left my parish in Raleigh, North Carolina, I thought I had a pretty good handle on evangelization. I'd been working youth ministry and different types of ministry and working on how do I evangelize my own parish when I was a director of faith formation. Um, when I left youth and became the director of faith formation, I asked this committee of adults, I said, what is the greatest problem you have? And they said, oh, hands down, it's how do you engage the parents? Sound familiar? Yeah, it's like, mm, poof, hit your head against the wall. How do you do it? And so that's why I found this model. But after applying that, uh, be beginning to plan for that model, and this isn't a talk about that model, uh, I did notice one critical piece, and that was this, is that if we took the same catechetical content and applied it to this new catechetical model of all generations catechesis, without making it evangelistic in nature, it'll have a very short shelf life. Because the substance of what we're catechizing with is based on one critical assumption, and that is that everyone who gets baptized has already got it. And so we catechize that way, assuming that they know what to do with the information that we give them, and it's so far from the truth, as we can tell, because, you know, instead of creating disciples, when our teenagers get their, you know, sacrament of confirmation, what do they want to do? Leave the church. Something isn't right. So as I was kind of praying through tonight and saying, Lord, how do we do this and how do we uh, develop this whole process, I, I 
decided to go ahead and launch from a particular passage, and I hope I got this right. This particular passage from Luke, this is from um, Zechariah after John the Baptist is born and he makes this proclamation. This is the tail end of it. Thus he has shown us the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And as you can see, I've highlighted a couple of particular areas, and that's where I'm kind of going to go through. And the first one is the hands of our enemies. When I was on the road for the first couple of years, and I was just crisscrossing the country, going from parish to parish, doing some preaching ministry, parish missions, staff retreats, things like that. By the way, I got to tell you that staff retreats, probably the, the staff are the second most difficult audience to do a retreat for. Second only to high school Catholic youth. <laughs> For some, because, and they do the same thing. They feel like they've already gotten everything they need. Whoa, you guys aren't laughing now. <laughs> that wasn't a slap, but I think in a lot of ways, you know what happens? We go to the places like this, or we go to a retreat, and it's very hard to take that minister hat off, isn't it? Because we're constantly looking for that next greatest thing. What can we find? Some good tidbits that we can use. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves no longer in a position where we open ourselves up to receive what the Lord really has for us to hear individually. And you know as well as I do from a, from a ministry perspective that if there's going to be any revitalization in the parish, it has to happen through those who are initiating it first. Amen? That's us. And that's one major roadblock we're going to have to overcome. It's a huge battle. So I started going out, and I was looking at parishes and doing the different things, and I was realizing that, particularly when I was praying, uh, when I was preaching missions, you'd get out there, and, and you'd start preaching to the people, and, and I, it was a very weird um, sensation I began to realize. I, I, I felt sometimes when I was at different parishes, like I was in a phone booth, talking to a crowd and they couldn't hear me that's kind of the sensation it felt like and I couldn't understand what that was at first it was just this idea of it seems like every I keep throwing things out there preaching the gospel sending material out and it was hitting the glass and falling down and it was never penetrating and as I kept saying, Lord, what is going on? What is, what is happening here? And as I would have different experiences, uh, I experienced something like that at a particular youth conference. I, I was with Jim Beckman one time, and I was uh, in the midst of my talk, and Jim comes walking out in the middle of the talk, and he says, hold on one second, let's stop. And then he says, I sense the spirit of oppression over this crowd. Let's pray against the spirit of oppression. And that for me was just, boom, light came on, and I began to realize, hello, that makes total sense. And as I began now with my eyes open and beginning to realize what is this sensation, and I started to pursue more and pray more about this and say, Lord, what's really going on? What's happening here? I began to realize uh, and then eventually began to see some really harsh realities, like for example, did you know that there is a cohort of demons assigned to your parish? And their job is to make sure that your job remains unfruitful. And how naive it is for, of us to sit there and think, well, all we need to do is find the next book or the next program. And if we just take that and apply it to our parish, that this is going to bring about the renewal. And not think that there's an enemy out there who's going to counteract everything that we'd attempt to do. And we're not paying any attention. It's almost like as if we're at a battlefield and we've got these new weapons, this new program, and we're looking at how it works and how to make it all function. And when we're focused on this, and meanwhile, the enemy has just flanked our lines and is now in our camp. And they're neutralizing the gospel. So for me, I began to realize that I needed help. And in my ministry, instead of going around and soliciting money, I solicit prayer warriors. And I've got about 300 prayer warriors who are praying for you tonight. 
And their job every week is I send out prayer requests. And when I call parishes and I'm there and, I, and they want me to come and do a mission and we're leading up to the mission, I said, okay, so tell me, where are the negative activities at your parish? What's happening that's negative? Because that's how you identify the demonic influences in your parish. What are the negative things that are taking place? Is there gossip? Is there oppression? It seems like nothing seems to be sinking in. Is there, great, is there a great spirit of fear that's going on where people are just afraid to do anything? The priests are afraid to preach the truth because afraid the people aren't going to be receptive. All of that is open game. And that's how you identify what they're doing in their parish. And once I start getting that l list, I bring it to my prayer warriors. And long before I show up, we start praying and asking Mother Mary to begin to start suppressing or destroying these strongholds. And I can't tell you the difference that we recognize, that I recognize, when we are actively praying against the influence of the enemy and their strongholds in our parish. Amen. I was... I was in Texas, I won't say where, but I was in Texas in this one small town. And uh, I was on a conference call and I walked across the street to a park and I'm just walking around the park I'm on this conference call. And, and as I started walking back to the church, I didn't see it, but I sensed, this is, this is a small little town in Texas, railroad goes through it, and there's only one Catholic church in the town. And as I looked at the church, it seemed, I couldn't see it, but it appeared, I just sensed it, that there was this big, massive demon sitting on top of the church, and the church was his throne in the town. Seven years prior to me coming to this particular parish to start helping bring about some renewal there, they had not had any sacraments except for Eucharist for 30 years. The enemy's alive and well. The pastor was, when I was done doing some training there, the pastor confessed before the whole group. He said he, he started to, to experience some hope that maybe we can begin to turn things around. And he's, he's a priest from India, and he felt like he wasn't being effective. He was just about ready to go to the bishop to ask to be removed because he didn't feel like he, could, he was the right priest for the job. Another parish that I, was, I went to, um, I, I got there, and there was just, um, there was just, the, again, s something that was just in the way, and I couldn't understand why, so I started asking more questions. Well, tell me about what's going on with this town. Where's, what's the history of the town? And, and they shared a little bit about the town and how there's one church on one side of the river, another church on the other side of the river, and great segregation between the town. And, and, and then the pastor says, well, you know, our property, the railroads came through here, and our church property on the corner of it is where a huge massacre occurred of Chinese immigrants. The Irish, the railroaders were trying to push out the Irish who were uh, uh, revolting against the payment, and they brought in all these Chinese immigrants to continue the railroad, and the Irishmen, Catholics, went over and slaughtered all these. And so the spirit of death was very present. And as a community, we began to pray against the spirit of death to remove them from the grounds. One last story just to kind of give you a sense. I was at this other parish, and I was preaching the weekend homily, so Saturday comes and it's time for distribution of Eucharist, and I'm standing there in my spot, and I'm distributing communion, and all of a sudden this woman walks up, and body of Christ, and she doesn't look at me, no eye contact, amen, and I give her communion, and I'm like, oh, what was that? Lord, what was that? And I just continue, I'm like, that just disturbed my spirit. What was that? And then, a little bit later, another woman comes up, same thing, whoa. Uh, five people at that liturgy, that 5 p.m. liturgy, came and experienced that same thing. Just wham! I'm like, wow, Lord, what was that? And then tomorrow, the Sunday, the next thing, two more masses, same thing. Another dozen women came up, and by the time that second mass was done, it was very clear. The spirit of incest was evident and present in this town. And on, on sun, Sunday night, I usually don't. I kind of keep quiet and just pray and send a note out to my prayer warriors and said, I need you to pray about this. But for some reason, the Lord just compelled me to, to talk about it. 
I said, and I just blurted out, I said, you know, I've never been in a town or a church where I have experienced the spirit of incest as I do so prevalently as I do in this parish. Thinking, oh, probably shouldn't say that. Doesn't really endear you to the people. It's like, you know, one of the things I went, Whoop, you can never take that back. So, we're done, and every night after the mission, we did this social, and that cake and, and cookies and punch and coffee, and um, I'm there and chatting with people, and one by one, different groups came up and said, Deacon, I got to tell you, you were dead on about that. Incense runs rampantly in this town. See, I think a lot of times we don't pay attention. You certainly aren't, haven't heard much about the enemy in our lifetimes, have we? It's not something that's commonly preached about, which really, frankly, it needs to be because our people are disposing themselves to more and more evil. And incest, I believe incest is the number one way that people are getting demonized, where they have demons on the inside of them because there's, it's happening all over the place. More and more people are having these experiences and they're just opening themselves up because nobody believes that, there's the, de that the devil is real. I was in New Jersey doing an in-service for Catholic, a, women's, a girls' Catholic high school, and I read a reference to demons, and the assistant principal said, demons? You mean they're real? I thought that was just stuff on television. The prevailing thought, you know, their weaponry is they don't want you to believe that they're real. And then once you come to believe that they are real, then their next weapon is they want to make you afraid. They want to make you afraid. That is their M.O. Being rescued from the hands of our enemies. Uh-oh, did I not hit it right? There we go. 1 John 3, 8. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. You see, our effort is not just to lead people to God, but it's also to undo the work of what the devil has been doing in our people's lives. But i got to be honest with you, if you're anything like me, which I suspect you are, a major part of that battleground is to undo the work the devil has done in you. Like, for example, I did that opening little exercise. I do that just about everywhere I go now with groups that I talk about because I found with large audiences in parishes that if I don't give you permission to reach out and talk to strangers, you won't. Isn't that true? We don't. It doesn't happen in parishes. The very few, first few years, I did parish visitations and did evaluations on, from an evangelistic standpoint. What would a visitor, visitor experience at your parish um, if they were coming to your parish to, you know, looking for God? And I'll tell you the truth. If I was looking for the love of God, I probably would never go to a Catholic church. I probably wouldn't. And part of it is maybe because I won't understand, you know, some of the solemnity and the prayer before. But oftentimes we go to Mass and we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We experience His Eucharistic presence with perfect strangers, and that's satisfactory for us. If I'm a stranger coming to your parish and you don't even want to know my name, how will you ever get to the place to share with me Jesus? See what I mean? And it's not because we're bad people, and it's not because our parishioners are bad. It's because there is an enemy out there who is influencing us to great lengths, and we're bringing it in our house. And we're utilizing it in our house. We're utilizing the same systems. We're putting on the mask, just like the world trained us to do, are we not? Only what we've learned to do is make it a good, holy Catholic mask. Praise you, Jesus. Right? Tell me your family isn't like mine. When my kids were younger, you know what it's like trying to get my five daughters and my wife ready for church? <laughs> Please tell me your family is like mine. Tell me. Because I'm telling you what, from my house to the church takes 10 minutes, door to door. So I would wake up my family an hour and 15 minutes before Mass, thinking that, you know, it takes them an hour to get ready, 10 minutes to get there. That means we actually get there and walk down the aisle and sit in our seats for five minutes before Mass begins. But you know what happens. Something happens here, somebody's fighting there, and next thing you know, what time is it? Seven till. What am I doing? I get my kids in the car. We start driving down the road. <laughs> Shut up! We're going to church! We're driving around, driving around. And then all of a sudden, we park the car. Ah! 
And that's where the miracle happens. The doors open and, ah! <laughs> and all of us walk out into the church like the Partridge family, all lined up, nice and straight. John, how are you? God bless you. Mary, how's the gallbladder? Bless your heart. And then you go get ready to get a seat, but you're late, and sure enough, you sit, get ready to sit down, and someone is sitting in your pew. Well, would we'll you sit behind them and pray through them? I mean for them for the entire Mass. Right? And you, then we do what the church, you know, what we're supposed to do, what everyone expects, because it's all about the training we receive. You see, you don't have to be Catholic so long as you look Catholic. And so what do we do? We do the, the Christian calisthenics. Kneel, sit, stand. Kneel, sit, stand. Kneel, sit, stand. Amen. And then we get ready to go. Marching back out to the car. God bless you. Oh, I'll pray for you. The doors, everybody gets in. The doors close. Shut up! We're going home! Please tell me your family was like mine. Right? We have been trained so well by the world, and the problem is that we're bringing in so much of the garbage out there, and we're still applying it to our Catholicism, our Christianity. And so it's not authentic. And the devil is the one who's been influencing us, and the influence is in us, and that fear runs rampant in us. Does it not? Tell me, I, I'm not telling you something you don't already know. We know this. We experience this on multiple levels. As a, as a director of, uh, of faith formation in my parish, I had this six foot seven father in Raleigh, North Carolina, come to the church, and he wanted me, I was in charge of confirmation, and he said, my son is a baseball player, and he can't be at your retreat, so, and I want him to get confirmed, so I'd like you to do a private retreat for him. I said, well, gosh, yeah, that's quite a dilemma. No. <laughs> what do you mean, no? I, I won't do that. Listen, I want my son to get confirmed. Then I guess you'll have your son miss the baseball game. No, he's going to be at the baseball game. You need to do a private retreat. I'm sorry, I will not do that. Because I have like another 65 other students, and if I do it for your son, then I'm going to have no life, and I like my marriage and my family. So if you want yours, I can't believe you're denying my son the sacrament. No, I'm not. You're the priest of your family. You're making the decision. And so you can imagine a six foot seven guy standing over a little hobbit, you know, dude like me going, you're going to change. And I'm like, I am sorry, I am not. And this was an old convent. My office was upstairs and the secretaries are down there going. So finally, I just wouldn't budge. He goes, the pastor's going to hear about this. Doosh, 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 doosh. The secretary goes, Ralph? <laughs> yes? Are you okay? <laughs> my heart is still in my throat, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. He didn't like that. <laughs> you think? I know, we've all had these experiences. And you know, and it's not that that father was being bad. He's trying to do the best with what he was given. I know, because I was one of those guys that was given the same stuff. Thank God we've made so many corrections on catechetical materials and what we should be doing. We still have some ways to go with evangelization components because the things that I'm finding around the country is that, you know, the mission of the church, right? Matthew 28, go make disciples. And it takes two things to make a disciple. Evangelization, connect them with the person of God through the power of the Holy Spirit, and discipleship training. And what I'm finding is that in most churches, we're doing, if we're lucky, 30% discipleship training with zero evangelization. And we wonder why our teenagers want to leave the church when they're confirmed. We are not making the connections. And the enemy is doing a great job of keeping us in this problem. I'm not, again, telling you anything you don't know. 
because we're all in the trenches trying to figure out what's going on. And I want you to awaken you to the realization that the enemy has been doing so much on them. And the easiest way you're going to identify what the enemy is doing to them is examine what he has done to you. Because it's so prevalent in us. That conversion really does have to happen in us. That taking and accepting faith really does have to happen in us. We really have to live from a place of authentic faith if we're going to give it away. Because you know as well as I do, we cannot give what we do not have. How can we share authentic faith with someone when we don't have it? All we do is push material or give them knowledge, but it takes more than knowledge. It has to be leading people to entrust God based on the knowledge we have given them. But instead, we give them knowledge and expect that they know what to do with it, and they don't. And it becomes this difficult challenge. So, serve without fear. This is a critical piece. How do we serve without fear? Because that's something that motivates us all the time. We respond more to fear than we do anything else. Why do you think it's Satan's number one weapon? It is truly his number one weapon, fear. I do a lot of men's retreats, and I was at this one particular retreat in California, and I had everything else planned, and in the middle of it, right, just ready to start my first talk, the Spirit jumped in and took, took a left turn, and I'm like just following the Spirit, and, he bas and basically I turned around and I said, you know, guys, I've got six talks ready for you this weekend to help you grow spiritually, but here's the truth. The truth is, is what is the value of giving you all this great content when you know as well as I do that you're only going to act on whatever it is that your fear will allow you to go to? I mean, that's the truth. That is the bottom line. And you want to know if we're going to become effective in the new evangelization, I'm going to give you what I believe is a very hard truth, and that is that we are not ready as a church in local parishes to implement the new evangelization. Oh, we're trying. We're looking for books. We're looking for programs. We're looking for the quick, easy fix. But there is no quick, easy fix. And there is no magic program or no one book or no one process that's going to do it. But we do not want to pay what it's really going to take to see the new evangelization. And until we move to that place where we're ready to go there, we're going to keep looking for quick fixes. I go around and I, I hang out with priests once in a while, and every once in a while a priest will come up and say, well, Deacon Ralph, you're doing all these different things. Why don't you give me one or two great little programmatic things you've done that have really, you know, knocked home and set up, you know, parish on fire. And I just smile. There's only one person, one person, who's already at your parish, who knows exactly what needs to be done at your parish to bring about the new evangelization. One person, and he is the Holy Spirit. But we do not, do not want to go through the effort of what it takes to train an authentic disciple to do. You see, I was at this parish once, and I, we, were, we were talking about discipleship. And I asked the people, you know, and I was just, this was a training for the staff, and I said, how many of you are disciples of Jesus Christ? And of course, they all raised their hands. And I said, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then answer me this. Who are your disciples? Because every disciple of Jesus Christ should be discipling others. That is our identity as a disciple. The Holy Spirit uses a disciple to form and fashion disciples. So who are your disciples? I said to them. And this DRE, this wonderful lady who just kind of, you know, speaks what she's thinking. She just said, I don't have time to make disciples. I'm the DRE. And I just, she said that and just blurted it out. And I, I almost responded immediately and I just stopped because I'm like, that was perfect. <laughs> and then every, everyone just let that sink in. And then we, they started to chuckle. And then it became humorous. But the reality was so true. It was so true. We're so busy doing programs that are not functioning that we have no time to actually make those disciples. So we have to figure out how is it that we're going to make those disciples. 
And you see, we have to be able to begin to train people up on what to do with the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but it's the best kept secret of the church. Did you ever get trained at all on what to do and how to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit in your religious education? Has it ever been a part of your formation? And yet everything that happens, is this not true? Do we not hear this in our preaching? Do we not get it from the church fathers where they tell us that everything that is done, it's done because God does it, yes? Then why are we not connecting them to God? Why are we not making sure that they know how to discern the voice of God, to listen to the Spirit, and to act and live and operate in the power of the Holy Spirit? Because that's what discipleship training does. Instead, the people do what they've been trained to do. They come and they become the pew potatoes. And they spud out in church. And they look to the priests and deacons and the nuns and the lay professionals, and they say, my job is to just occupy time and space and throw some cash in the basket. Your job is to do the work of the church. You see, we've basically formed them to be country club members, where they come and they pay their dues, and they use whatever part of the church they want, but beyond that, they have no further responsibilities. And then we wonder why when we say, we really need some volunteers. Who's going to help? And everybody's too busy doing their own thing. Something's not right. Something's got to change. And there's some pretty inherent things that are in the way. First and foremost is this fear. I mean, on multiple levels within the life of a parish. Fear of confrontation. That six foot seven dad... Don't want to do that again. How many times do you keep trying to hold the line, hold the line, and it's just like a tidal wave of parents that keep coming after you year after year, telling you, I need you to bend because my kids' sports or activities. Year after year, and the line keeps slipping, keeps slipping, until basically you just have to get, bring your kids twice to get confirmed. It's happening. I was talking to a couple of places in Southern California. They're not even offering religious education classes in between the sacrament years anymore. Why? Because nobody's coming. It's all about the carrot, isn't it? I mean, religious education only has one purpose, isn't it? It's to receive their sacraments. That's what I got. And then I was told, I I'm done. I mean, as a DRE, I understand. We don't want to, we, we like to enjoy our jobs. We don't like the rejection. It's hard. And of course, then we're afraid of losing families, right? And that's a, a pastor's great stress. And God bless these men. But, you know, sometimes the pressure the diocese puts on you and the priests, my brothers, they expect you to make sure, I, I know, I was talking to a pastor once and, and he said, you know, Ralph, Never once have I gotten a letter, never once have I gotten a notebook from the diocese to tell me how to increase the faith life of my parishioners, never once. But every year I get a thick notebook that tells me how to have a successful BAA, Bishop's Annual Appeal. You want to know a very inherent problem in the church and one that we're going to have to overcome if you want to see the new evangelization? We have to stop serving money first before God. Because it's so, you know, and it's true. God bless these guys. They're not going to get a phone call because they went through your books every year, you know, to check and see how many baptisms. And if you're not going to have the dean or the vicar general call and say, we notice your baptisms are down. You know, last year you had seven RCIA people and now you had five. You're down. What's going on? You're not going to get a phone call like that. But if you don't bring in your money, oh, you're going to get a phone call. You see what I mean? And so what does that do to our brothers? We need to pray for our priests. God bless them because they got the big targets. You got the smaller ones, they got the big targets. Because we need them to stand up. And it is hard. Listen, it's hard to stand there at the door, you know, when you say goodbye, when people are leaving. Like I remember I just got ordained and my pastor said, Ralph, you're the married clergy, why don't you preach on birth control? 
So I did, naively, and I shared my story, and I talked about it. And I said, if anybody wants to email me, please, feel free. I'd love to have more conversations. By 2 o'clock that afternoon, my email was overrun. I could no longer fit anymore. Who the hell are you to tell me what to do in my bedroom? People leaving mass, saying the vilest things to you because you decided to speak truth. See, this is where the enemy comes in and says, this is how we're going to hold you down. Because unless you've got some superhuman ba battle armor on, or I don't know what it takes, but you got to get a thick skin because this idea of trying to please people, forget it. You try to please one group over here, you tick off that group. You try to please that group, you, you tick off that group. And finally you realize, Lord, i got to just worry about pleasing you because I'm going nuts here. But that's, that's the work of the enemy penetrating our hearts, penetrating our lives, trying to get you to shut up and not speak the truth. Trying to get you to minimalize what is most important. And we lose sight of what's there because all of a sudden we're looking at all this crazy stuff, you know. Everything that's just hitting us there and we're missing the souls. We're missing the flock. We're seeing that they're getting attacked by wolves and now we're not able to help them. Because we're just licking our own wounds from being bitten. I'm going to tell you one really tough thing. The one thing I've seen across the country that just is, it's, it's grieving my heart and it's alarming me, is that the people who are in charge of ministries in these parishes that I'm going to across the country, they are not praying. We are not praying. We're not praying for our people. We're not praying for specific events. We're not bathing our lives in, in prayer so that we can get connected and have the strength to remain standing when the people need us to stand. We are not praying. We're not connected to God. We're so busy doing that we're not creating the time to be with God. So I, I had my son... He became a youth minister. He graduated from the university. I had $5, so, you know, he married in. He's a tall guy. He's not a hobbit like the rest of us. And he said, Dad, it'd be silly for me, since you've been doing this for 27 years, what, would you mentor me? And I said, absolutely, I would love to. And he goes, well, where do we begin? And I said, that's easy. Let's just imagine that I'm your direct report and that every year I'm going to evaluate you. 50% of my evaluation of your efforts this year is going to be based on one thing how well you did at coming in at the beginning of your day, dropping your stuff on your desk, grab your calendar, and go into adoration, and you spend 30 minutes with the Lord every day. And so he's like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, you need to pray through everything. So you look at your calendar. How many meetings do I have? I got three meetings with three kids. Pray for each kid by name. I got staff meeting. Pray for every person on your staff. I'm meeting with Father. Pray for Father. And then when you're done praying for everything in your calendar, then pray for the, the uh, appointments that you're going to have that are divinely set up that you don't even know about. Pray, 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 asking for the strength. The courage to stand up because you know you got a parent meeting. When's the last time we actually prayed with concern for the parents instead of vile feelings and thoughts? <laughs> Guilty is charged. Oh Lord, give that six foot seven man a horrible rash. <laughs> I am but a sinner. But that's what I would do. I, I, I mean, sometimes it would, the anger, because I wouldn't do what the scriptures were calling me to do. Forgive. Don't let the sun set on your anger. How many of us have gone to bed each night angry at different people, our own staff people or parishioners, because of things they said and they didn't understand, it was misunderstood. And all the while, who's in the mix smiling? Satan. Who's in the mix stirring up the nest, getting you to focus on anger and hatred instead of love? And forgiveness, Satan. Who's the one that wants you separated so that you have a bunch of silos on your staff? Satan. You see, if we don't pull together and recognize that we're actually on the same team and start pooling our resources, it's never going to happen. If I'm on staff with you and all that happens is that your door is closed all the time, that shows me it's an unhealthy parish staff. When you can't have the doors open and there's little quiet conversations. 
chit-chatting softly so no one else hears because you're probably talking about them. This is how they work. This is how they penetrate. This is how they win and render us inactive. 2 Timothy 1.7. Let me read to you before that we get to 7. I want to start from 5. It says this. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. Now I am sure in your lives. How is he sure, by the way? Is that just an assumption? No, he's sure. How is he sure? He can see it. He can see faith. Hmm. What does that look like? For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God within you. See, this isn't just for him, for Timothy. This is for us. Listen to Paul's word to us. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is in you. What is the gift? What is the gift that God gave us? His what? Grace in the form of his Holy Spirit alive and active in us. He wants, Timothy, stir this spirit up in you. Operate in the life of the Spirit that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and love and of self-discipline. Do we believe that people receive the Holy Spirit in sacraments? Yes or no? Then why do they continue to live in sin? Why do they continue to live powerless? Why is there no power? And why are we just kind of going through the motions, continuing to do the same old, same old, and not even paying attention? You see, I'm just a simple guy. I'm just a simple hobbit deacon trying to go out there and do something. But you know, this is how simple it is for me. I want to come and I want to use something. I want something to happen. I turn on the switch. And there is no power. There's no light. Is there a light bulb? Yeah. Is it connected? Yes. But there is no power. When something like that happens, I ask a very simple question. Why is there no power? <laughs> so once I ask the question, I follow it up. Uh -huh. Why don't we do that in ministry? I'm just curious. We never do that for ministry. Why isn't a kid who confesses, who goes and gets his sacrament of confirmation, why does he leave the sacrament of preparation process questioning whether he even believes in God? Why do I not see any active activity of the life of God in him or her? Why don't we ask the question? Where's the power? I don't know about you, but for me, my experience was that when I encountered the living God, I could not avoid the power. He was there. How can you not experience the life and love and power and peace and love of God and all that he has to offer us and not know that he's there? But you know what it looks like? It kind of looks like this. Come here, can I borrow you for a second? What? I'm being called up front? Come on. Come on upstairs. What's your name? JJ. JJ. Thanks for being a victim. I mean, a, a volunteer. Appreciate that. JJ, close your eyes and put your hand up like this, like we're going to clasp hands, okay? Close your eyes, okay? Now, I just want you out loud, as loud as you can, to share what you experience physically in your hand right now. Nothing. Nothing. Isn't that what our kids are going through and getting in their sacraments? They're not what they're getting, what they're experiencing. Yes or no? Yeah. I don't know about you, but that's not the way it's supposed to be. Back up again. If something changes, and I'll let you face the audience because it's more fun if they see your face. Okay? <laughs> if something changes, you got to scream it out, and I need you to articulate what you're experiencing. Okay? If something changes. Okay, everybody, let's just leave the room. <laughs> oh, hey. I'm feeling a pull. I'm going to die. 
Excellent. You can open your eyes. Almost, huh? Shoo! Give him a hand. Thank you. Did you see his reaction? Oh! I just encountered someone. Oh! Someone besides me is here. Oh! I feel this pulling. And rightly so. I'm going to die. <laughs> but you see the difference. There is power that we're supposed to receive. Paul tells us, when you receive me, it's not a spirit of fear. But why are we operating in fear? Because we are not operating in faith. We're operating in knowledge. What I want to know is, have you entrusted your entire ministry to the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you acting through the Spirit, or are you resting on your own abilities? Because God has much more for the people, and he wants to flow through you to minister to your people. But sometimes we stop because we think he doesn't want to use somebody like me. I mean, I have no business being here. You've got some big dog hitters over there that are really good. I have no business being here, except for I finally got the memo. <laughs> Ralph, get out of the way and let me roll. That's all he wants to do. And you guys have amazing, powerful gifts that he wants to activate. But we don't live in faith. We live in a spirit of fear. Am I good enough? I don't know enough. How am I going to have the right answers? How is this going to happen? And we have no trust in God's word. Did he not tell the apostles, I will give you the words? But we don't live that. We just live the easy stuff. Go to Mass on Sunday. Do these things. But to live in authentic faith... This is what the enemy does not want you to do. Doesn't want you to live that way. He wants you to remain totally fearful. Oh good, I got six hours to go. <laughs> to serve in righteousness. Righteousness. Well, in my workshop this morning we talked about Faith, and the only way that we can be reckoned as righteous is in faith in Christ, is to have authentic faith in him. The faith, the kind of faith that you entrust to him completely, where you really place trust in him. For the longest time, I was doing ministry purely from a defensive position, always afraid that I was going to mess up, always afraid I might say the wrong thing. And then, before then, I thought, well, I can't even let my volunteers do talks because I'm afraid they're going to say the wrong things instead of trying to empower them. And if they mess up, okay, we're human. Let's make the correction. We all learn and move on. But instead, we're working from a place of defense when we have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're working from a place where we think we are powerless and Satan seems to be dominating our parishes because we don't believe we got a big daddy. Who's your daddy? I mean, either he is the king of kings and the lord of lords, the God, the creator of the universe, or he's not. And if you believe that that's true, then how is it making your ministry different? How is it encouraging you to step out and take that leap of faith, to put yourself out there, to reach out to the stranger and say, I don't know you, who are you? Welcome to the parish. To allow God to move you to the places that scare the hell out of you because he has a plan for you. You see, he actually wants to scare the hell out of you. And so, instead, we sit back in fear, and we're afraid. But Paul says, but to the one who, without works, trusts him. That trust is a key thing, guys. Everywhere I go across the country, when I'm looking as an evangelist, the battlefield, when I'm looking in the pews, it's the battle for faith. I love what Gandhi said. Gandhi made, he read the scriptures and he said, I read your Bible and I'm here to tell you I would become a Christian if I could find one. I think that was a very condemning statement. Because we profess to believe but we live our lives as if it's not true or it's not going to happen. And the people are watching us. 
the core. They're watching what we do. That's why I said the, way, the only way the new evangelization is going to really engage is if we're prepared to sacrifice, to suffer, to die, and move up to the next level. And until we're prepared to do that, we are going to remain in the rut we are. Jesus told us it was going to happen. People are going to hate you because of me. But what did he also say? Remember in Mark 16, when he talked about, it was the other Mark and Great Commission text? He said, those people who believe, they will experience and do amazing things through the power of the Spirit. He wasn't just talking about the apostles. He didn't just say in the apostolic times. He said, those who believe will do amazing miracles. Are we witnessing that? Are we teaching that? Are we teaching people to prepare to do that? Or are we just saying, here's what it means to be Catholic. Don't get me wrong. We need to do that. But there's so much more we can give. But we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. It's going to get hard. You think Satan has made it hard for us now? It's going to get harder. It's going to become so much more difficult. So much more difficult. All right. Point it the right way. Practical applications. Learn to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have this question for you. Are you operating in the power of the Spirit? Not are you just a naturally well-organized person and know how to do organizational things. Do you understand what it means to be operating in the power of the Spirit? Where the Spirit begins to start working through you. Where he starts ratcheting up your game because you're letting go and entrusting him. If you start asking God, you show me how to operate in your power, be careful, because he's going to start taking away control from you. He's going to start taking things away. I was sharing with someone earlier, and I, I was ready at this parish to do a parish mission, and I spent time in prayer all week long preparing for the mission, and I showed up with zero in my book for what I was going to talk about. I spent three hours in adoration the day of, the first night, ready to go. I left there with zero on my pad. Lord, I hope you got something. He wasn't giving me anything until I stood on the spot. Did he say, go with this? And then from that point on, next thing I know, I blink and the night's over. He had to take it all away from me. All my prior planning, all my comfort zone, you know. Gosh, I'd love to have just a bone, God. Give me something. He gave me squat because he brought me to a place where he's saying, either you're going to trust that I am God and that I want to do this more than you do, that I want to be more successful than you do than you are, than you want to be. Until you come to believe that, then you're still going to operate purely from your own power. Learn to be operated by God's power. When I was working with a, par with a pastor, I uh, was doing this training, and I had to leave it on a flight at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday, catch my flight. And Dinner was done at 1, and pastor's looking at his watch. He says, okay, let's get started. Let's get started. So we got everybody. It seemed, seemed kind of rushed. And he's looking at his watch as I'm continuing. I got this next segment. And finally, it's like, you know, almost 2 o'clock. And he goes, Deacon, it's almost 2 o'clock. you got to leave in an hour. Are you going to roll out the plan? And I'm like, I'm sorry, Father. What plan is that? The plan to revitalize our parish. Isn't that why you came? To show us the plan? I'm like, I don't have a plan for you, Father. And then he just said, well, excuse me for asking, but then why are you here? I said, I see my mission, Father, is to help you and this parish staff learn how to become led by the Spirit because he is the one who knows what to do. But you know, that is a death that's really hard to die, is it not? I mean, to sit down and learn to wait upon the Lord. We got 16,000 things on a list screaming at us to tell us what to do. And we have the, the time to just sit and be still. Remember what Jesus told Mary? Martha has made the greater choice. Mary made the greater choice. Sorry. <laughs> Come on, guys. It's been almost an hour, okay? I'm getting a little tired. Thank you for laughing. It made me know I did it wrong. 
You know what I mean. But we don't like to do that be still stuff. You know, for me, the reason why, I'll be honest, the reason for me why that was so hard to learn how to do was because I only felt like I was fruitful for God if I was doing stuff. I was still earning his love. Like I said, we got to go back and we got to see what the enemy is doing in us so that we can see how we can free our parishioners. Because they're just like us. One of the things I've learned very clearly, and that's why I count on my prayer warriors heavily, is that the battle is always won in prayer. Always. Long before I show up, if the prayer has been done, that's one of the reasons why I think the Steubenville conferences, particularly the youth, because I've had a lot of exposure to those, are so amazingly impactful, is because of the prayer that goes into it. The anointing is heavy. And I can tell when I've traveled around the country from conference to conference which organization has their prayer warrior team intact and functioning because the anointing is stronger in those places. It makes kind of logical sense. It's, it's, it's not rocket science, but it requires our death to be still, to pray, to fight, and realize that prayer is a very, it's absolutely essential. It is our lifeline to the power to break away burnout. Next is parish-wide vision. This is another thing that I've, I'm seeing everywhere I go is that you might have 12 staff, and then when I go in and I ask all 12 staff individually in an interview, well, tell me, say we got this guy Charlie over here and we want to evangelize him. Uh, um, what does that evangelization look like? Or what is the mission of the church? And I get 12 different answers. So it's kind of like Moses coming around and saying, okay, when you hear the horn blown, it's time to go. Okay, so start packing up. Second horn means we're leaving in 15. Third horn means move out. And then when the third horn blows, 12 tribes move out in 12 different directions. Because what's ending up happening is parish staffs are being filled. Not everybody is blessed or wise to come and get trained like you are. And so what ends up happening is you've got good people who end up working in parish ministries and all they're doing is replicating the models they have witnessed. And so there is no unified, comprehensive vision where everybody on staff is talking and moving in the same direction. Vision. Vision. What is the model? You know what would really be cool to see? Is if a kid comes to mom and says, Mom, why do we have to go to church? And mom says, because we're supposed to. Wouldn't it be cool to see mom say, because I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ and this is where I need to come to get fed, to get strengthened, rebuilt, so I can go back out and do it again. How would that change how our youth understand what it means to be Catholic? Last but not least, minister, did I not put that up there? Okay, good. Minister to achieve the goal. That's that whole idea of the light idea. What is it that we're really trying to accomplish? What's the bullseye? What's the target? If it's to make a disciple, then are we going back to our parish programs and the things that we're doing and are we really doing the honest evaluations and saying does my confirmation program bear the fruit we desire if not then maybe it's time to change but then the question is how do we change what do we do what are we supposed to do because we don't know how to change we're so program dependent we don't know how to do anything outside of that why do you think and yet we're calling for a, a new evangelization which requires a new movement of the holy spirit which is called a new pentecost but we don't want to wait upon God. We don't want to call upon God. One last thought as I start wrapping things up and we'll open it up for some, some questions and answers. I was working with a pastor and a staff and I said, wouldn't this be amazing if your pastor came to you and said, in two weeks we've got to decide how we're going to try to implement this new evangelization endeavor. So here's what I want you to do. Every day, this week, I want you to go to adoration. When you come in, I want you to clock in, and I want you to go to adoration and spend one hour of your day. Everyone on staff, business manager, minister, everybody go pray. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want us to do for this parish? For two weeks, I want you to do that. And on the third, on that second Friday, we're going to meet in adoration. We're going to go to adoration for 
the first hour, and we're going to continue to pray. And then we're going to cut out all work for that morning, and we're going to get together, and we're going to sit in a room. And as your pastor, I'm going to go around, and I'm going to ask East of you, what did you hear the Holy Spirit say? Tell me, what would that do to your prayer life? Holy moly. Would that make you become much more conscious on trying to listen to what the Spirit's trying to say to you? Because you know what we do right now, right? I mean, let's be honest. We get together in a staff meeting, we sit down, we open up with a token prayer. Oh God, come and bless this meeting. And then let's pull our resources, come out with brainstorming, we come up with our plan. Oh God, bless our plan. It's true, isn't it? I know what I'm talking about. I was in lots of those meetings. Instead, we don't sit down and go, Lord, what do you want to do? How do you want to transform my parish? But here's the key thing. Before you can become corporate discerners, you must become an individual discerner. The work must begin in you. So as the Spirit begins to prepare your parish for transformation, you must be getting prepared interiorly, in your heart, in your life. Do you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you activated by Him? Are you making it your aim to be guided by Him? It's a very hard thing to learn how to do. But that's what we're supposed to be training people in so that they can do it. Because you see, if I can train someone to become a disciple of Christ and I get that connect connected to the Holy Spirit and then they can listen to the Holy Spirit, then begins the next battle, to obey the Holy Spirit. And then as they start obeying the Holy Spirit, they actually start living, living in the power of the Spirit. And then the Spirit tells them directly what they're supposed to do. Instead of the pastor standing up front going, okay, here's what we're going to do. And then the people just stare at him and go, yeah, uh-huh. Is Mass over yet? It's a very hard challenge. But you know, the process is not a 45-point plan. But we have to begin to confront the enemy who has already entrenched himself even within our own thoughts and patterns and behaviors. And that's why we need the life of the Holy Spirit. Activated in us, Lord, you show me. Like tonight, we're getting ready to do adoration after the Q&A session. Instead of being a staff member who's coming and going, oh great, another adoration. Can we actually approach the Lord and say, Lord, you show me. You show me my heart. Show me what's in the way. Is it pride? Is it fear? Show me what is in the way so that I can become a much more docile tool for your spirit. Amen? Any questions? We have two microphones that are going to be running around. Here's one right here. Oh, wait, we have the first one here. First one here, and if you come up front, if you've got a question. And then you guys all got to pray that I can answer it. But I saw some priests, it looks like, so I'm covered. Score. Yeah, I was going to come up on the stage, but uh, Deacon oh, yeah. heard my okay. questions for Petrock and decided to take his chances with you, so... <laughs> We're starting an endeavor... Uh, I'm on a commission that the bishops asked me to be, and it's for youth and young adult ministry in our diocese, and I said I'd do it if we could root it in prayer. And so we've asked for, we're going to launch and ask parents to come to every all school mass and pray for the spirit of indifference to be dispelled at the Catholic high school and the, and the middle schools. Um, and for parishioners to pray for the youth in their parish. But honestly, I have no background in intercessory prayer. I just know it has to happen that Amen. way. Amen. So how do we do it? Okay, before you start those initiatives, you would find a small group of people first. Find the prayer warriors. Okay. Gather them together and bathe this in prayer for a period of time. Couple, three months, whatever, four months bathe it in prayer so that and, and begin to identify you said indifference the spirit of indifference is there so start praying specifically against the spirit of indifference and everything else that you say see there like if you were to say lord you show us reveal to us what else is there and just start taking a list of all the different things start praying actively against them before you approach the parents to start engaging okay because they will not be free to engage to ask people who are bound to pray for other people to be unbound yeah. isn't going to work 
So we need to, you need to get a core of parents who you know get it yeah. and already have the heart for that. Ask the Lord to bring them to you, identify them, get them to start praying. Are we praying corporate, I mean together, are we gathering to pray? Yes, all the above. Okay. Daily, corporately. All the above. One of my things for pastors is I tell pastors, I said, I believe a pastor needs to have a small group of people, seven, set five to seven people that they gather every Friday to pray for the pastor. So and they got to be able to speak. Uh, they got to be able to keep it all confidential and everything. So the pastor can come and he can share his own heart, his own wounds, his own brokenness, his own concerns for the parish where it never goes anywhere. Because that way we're praying for him and, and sustaining him. And he's got a group of people to do that. And then the staff people can come and utilize them as well. And then you can invite parishioners to pray also. The prayer chains and all the other different tools that parishes have. But that there has to be a core of people that know what's going on and specifics of what to pray for before you would start the initiatives. Like when I do parish missions, I would love if they prayed and, and bathed six months in prayer for that mission before we even get close to doing the mission. The people on the ground, besides my prayer warriors. I would love for that to happen. Great question. Someone else, if you come, if there's a lot, if you come over here to the microphone. And this is one of those awkward pregnant moments. Okay, yes. Um, you know, the verse, the be not yoked with, uh, unevenly, unevenly with other believers. You know, <laughs> you, you hear that verse before. And we're, we're looking at the high divorce rate that's going on. And so, you know, just... How do you strengthen the uh, the pre cana you know in our in our church that's going on to establish the the, the families that, there you know to solve some of these problems yes okay good I've just got a few minutes here to handle that question but um, seriously again obviously you're going to hear me say it it's going to begin with prayer but I would again go back and here's one of the interesting things is you're going to be throwing out questions to me but my disciples when they throw out questions like that I, I turn around and I say you're asking the wrong person who should you be asking the Holy Spirit but again we t isn't it true we're not accustomed to saying I got this serious issue and I don't know how to address it so let me go see if I can find is there an expert in the audience anyone father someone who could and really, it's the Spirit who knows that answer. So I would gather some people together, again, in prayer and discernment. Lord, you show me. How do we begin to do that? Obviously, there has to be good models, right? Because people grow up to live the models, right? So we have to figure out how we're going to strengthen the models. Are we praying for our families, our couples? Because, you know, you come to Mass, and you, when you're on the altar and you look out at the people, you see these married people, you know half of them came fighting that morning. It's true. I mean, my car illustration was really spoke a lot of truth to that. I mean, we do come that way. And so we need to pray for those people because we need to show people what it, a good marriage looks like because right now all their people are getting afraid to, to get married because they feel like they're going to fail. And so I'm not sure that we're doing a great job of being able to articulate that both from the pulpit and in the ways that we teach and then we talk about it. So that's, that's some good ways of doing that. Other questions? From your experience with um, doing intergenerational catechesis and stuff, our parish is a very large um, bilingual community that does mostly curriculum-based everything. Um, how would you suggest, or how did you experience that transition into um, something more led by the Spirit or using a curriculum in conjunction with, um, you know, an encounter with God? Okay, so... If I understand your question is how do we bring the evangelization into the process of, of the curriculum, mm -hmm. right? I, um, in your experiences, how is that, how is that transition made? Uh, well, the, generally the beginning of the year, well, first of all, I looked at the content and I always, I always uh, looked at whatever it was that we were going to teach with a particular goal in the end, right? And that is how is what we're going to teach today add and make the direct connection to the relationship with Jesus Christ that we're all supposed to be living in. How do we make that connection? So if I'm doing a, a teaching on uh, original sin, how do I make that connection to relationship with Jesus Christ? If I'm doing it to all the sacraments, how do that? Because right now, most people think the sacraments are the ends, right? Not the beginning. 
And so, but how do I now make the connection to, this is all goes back to a relationship with Jesus Christ. So in the content, the take-home kits that we prepared for all of that, everything was making a line back to a relationship with Christ. Really, what ended up happening is my, those parents that came, I have, it was a small parish. So I had like five, 600, 600 well, five, 550 families. And we had uh, 200 families of the 550 on the ro rolls coming. And it was the parents, not new people coming to the church, it was the parents who were coming that were waking up and realizing they didn't have a relationship with Christ. And so we were literally doing opening meetings, introducing them to a relationship with Christ, leading them to a place of conversion and leading them to pray the prayer of conversion and then talking about what does this conversion really mean? Because people don't understand that. People don't understand, you know, like for example, um, um, it says in the catechism, reference number 1131. It's that one text in the catechism that talks about the sacraments are efficacious in nature. You know, it's got those $100 church words. But the very last sentence is absolutely critical in that. It says that uh, the fruits of the sacraments will not come to fruition until someone is properly disposed. Well, I can't control the Holy Spirit and say, excuse me, miss, receive the Spirit, boom, and all of a sudden she's like lit on fire. I can't control God like that, nor am I supposed to. But there are things that I am supposed to do, and so I am supposed to lead her to a place of proper disposition. And St. Peter talked about that at Acts chapter 2. you got to be repentant, and you got to be baptized. Well, repentance means you stop acting like you're God, living by your own rules. And baptism, we don't do a good job of catechizing on baptism. We just talk about the right, but we forget about the fact that baptism basically means you die. You give God everything. When's the last time we led people to make that decision? I think what we're, we've fallen back to out of fear is it's, how do I... How do I show you how to add a little bit of Jesus to your already busy life instead of saying it's one or the other, your life in the world or your life completely to Jesus Christ? And we're so afraid of making people go to that decision because we're afraid they're going to say no. But our job as evangelists is to bring people to that decision. It is all Jesus or no Jesus. What did the scripture say? You can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and you can't serve mammon. And what are we trying to do? Teach them how to serve both. You can't do both. So every meeting, um, you know, everything would focus back. But the beginning of the year, we would do, I wouldn't go with the books. I wouldn't go with the content. We made up our own meeting, and it was evangelistic in nature and saying, it all starts with this, a relationship with Jesus Christ. I think every RCIA program, before they get into the RCIA stuff, needs to, why is it that RCIA has to be a certain amount of months? I don't understand. If I'm going to go, remember I told you I'm a simple guy, so if I'm going to go build a house, I can't start building the block walls until I got the foundation laid. Why am I building the walls where there's no foundation? Because it's, because Easter's coming? <laughs> well, isn't that what we're doing? It's based on time, not on production. Why? I'm just a simple guy. I'm, I'm asking the question, why? Why can't we go back to uh, I can't move you on to discipleship training until you're connected with God. So for me, that's kind that of how it. I did it. Sorry, it was really no. a long-winded answer. But Actually, we were talking about original sin earlier, just in our discussion, so that's funny that you brought it up again. So thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else otherwise? Yes, I see that hand. We have time for that. This clock makes no sense to me, so I'm not sure if, are we done? Last question? Okay, perfect. Yes. So, Deacon, I really liked everything you said, but how do I get my staff on board? Praise you, Jesus. <laughs> uh, bring them to the St. John Bosco. Amen, <laughs> brother. That's what I was going to say. Yes. Th that really, it becomes that question. Again, as my, if you were my disciple and you asked me that question, what would I respond back with? You're asking the wrong person, because who's the one who knows how to reach every one of your staff members? It is the Holy Spirit. He is the go-to person that we never go to. You know, we don't. We never go to him. I don't know why. He's the best-kept secret of the church. He happens to be God, 
for all, you know, but we never go to them. Um, but I mean, obviously, praying for each of them, talking about, uh, okay, so let's talk about an evangelistic process real quick, okay? It's the same kind of principle you would use, like if you're a parent who's lost kids from the faith. You know what I'm talking about? Like I, I, I run in contact with to these seniors who, who are grieving because their kids have left the church and they left the faith, and I said, and they don't know what to do, so they asked me, how do you evangelize? And I said, well, my first suggestion would be stop telling them what they're doing wrong. Don't tell them what they're not doing. You're not going to church. I'm concerned. They know what you believe. They know what you understand. Don't do that. Start using testimony. Right? It's the testimony of the saints that will overcome the kingdom of Satan, the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And so instead of saying that, saying, here is what happened to me at the John Bosco conference. Here is what I began to understand. Here's how the piece has made sense. What do you think about this? Begin the dialogue. But long before you begin those kind of testimonies, what are you doing? Praying, praying, praying. Sick mama on them.